Welcome to the MUFG Global Markets Podcast. I'm John Cook, and I'm joined today by George Goncalves, MUFG's head of U.S. macro strategy. It's Tuesday, August 15th, 2023. Welcome back to the podcast, George. Great to be on, John. Yeah, good to have you, and it's been a while. Uh, so plenty plenty to talk about, although there kind of always is plenty to talk about, it seems. Um, and it, it really has been a, a busy summer, uh, you know, as you know, top of mind, or most recently, I guess, uh, Fitch downgraded the U.S. Uh, from AAA to AA plus. Um, you know, uh, on on you know fiscal concerns as well as debt ceiling brinkmanship. Um, you know, but more broadly, fiscal concerns are definitely on the radar again for many investors. Um, interestingly enough, it's almost a flashback to August 2011 when the S and P downgraded the U.S. Um, but at the same time, very different. Uh, you know, personally, and you know, I was kind of interestingly, I was on vacation both times. You know, given it was August, and in, back in 2011, I cut my vacation short and headed back to the office, uh, whereas I didn't even consider doing that. Um, you know, uh, this year, um, you know, which which I think speaks to how it's, um, you know, how it's it, it just is a is less less big of a deal, although still important. Um, so, so I guess the question for you, George, is other than uh, the downgrades effect on my, the different effect on my vacation plans, how does this downgrade compare to 2011? Um, and also, you know, back to this, um, you know, back to this fiscal concern that, that we, that I mentioned earlier, you know, what are your thoughts on the Treasury's latest debt issuance plans as laid out in the quarterly refunding announcement? Yeah, well, I'm glad it didn't change your, uh, vacation plans this time around and me too i was really bummed out in 2011 yeah no no 100 percent. and but as you say it's still obviously an important uh development and uh consistent really with the overall kind of concerns that people are now having on the fiscal side but if you you know if you go back in time and, and really compare i think it, it's they are distinct periods even though it was the same sort of uh you know action s p taking down uh, ratings from AAA to AA plus, just like Fitch just did. But the key difference, obviously, is back then this was a, a, a new thing. It was a, it was a really something that was almost viewed as sacrosanct. That you know the U.S. is a AAA. How you know such a big move coming down from the AAA status that it caught the markets by surprise, and and it was a much bigger concern, obviously, at the first time you go through it. Uh, also, it's really important to realize the macro environment was different, um, as well as the Fed backdrop. I mean, the Fed had rates at zero still coming out of the financial crisis. We were just a couple years after the financial crisis, so you know, nerves were still pretty sore and people were still concerned um, about just financial stability in general. Um, and so rates were very, very low. But what it really did, though is it triggered a risk off and it pushed back to hiking expectations. Because if you go back and you really rethink, even uh, after the financial crisis, I mean, the market started to price in hikes because you know the natural reaction was you, you, you would expect the Fed to eventually raise rates again. You know, In hindsight, we know that they basically didn't raise rates for another virtually seven years or so uh, from the financial crisis uh, time period. So, uh, but you know, there was hikes priced in, the curve was steep. And so the only um, part of the curve that could actually move was long-term rates because the whole front end was anchored because rates were near zero. So when you had this risk off, it, it led to a big bull flattening uh, with tens and thirties leading the way and you know, really resulting in, in embedding a low rate environment for basically the foreseeable future from that point forward. So it was a really different environment um, you know, looking at it now, um, you know, like I guess one more point on the 2011 experience. Um, I mean, our debt loads were basically more than half of where they are now, roughly about 15 trillion um, for the total outstanding debt. Uh, it did uh, usher in a a period of fiscal austerity, and um, and that you know that sequestration period that we had. Which really, you know, we never really got out of that whole debt ceiling fight mentality, which really from that point forward continued until, you know, just as recently as this year, as we saw in May and June. So it it was a critical start of this whole fiscal story. Um, Whereas now, you know, we're 12 years into it plus and, uh, you know, Fitch for the various reasons, notably that they, you know, viewed 
fiscal situation will deteriorate even further. Our debt burdens are now, again, nearly double or more than what it was 12 years ago. And we continue to have political impasses, right? <laughs> it hasn't gotten any better. So uh, it's understandable. I mean, some people have called it bizarre that uh, that you know, Fitch decided to do it now. I mean, it was after the debt ceiling impasse that we just had. So, I mean, it's not a real big surprise, but nonetheless, uh, it still matters, I think. I mean, I think it at least serves as a reminder that we have to think about our fiscal situation and the unsustainable path that we're on. Um, and, um, you know, outside of this more bigger picture themes, uh, it, but also in line with this fiscal story is that there's a lot more debt that has to be issued in the very immediate term, both what happened post debt ceiling, which a large, a large part of that was done by T-bills, but now that's been basically satiated and there's only so much you could do with T-bills that we also heard at the beginning of the month, and which is a view that you know I've had for quite some time, that the, the, the Treasury was going to eventually have to term out the debt and issue more longer-term securities, and mostly in the belly and in the intermediate part of the curve. And, and that's what we got also in the same very week, uh, a big announcement for more debt uh, across the, you know, the curve with larger auction sizes. Um, you know, the market reacted in the way that at least this time was consistent. Rates went up <laughs> instead of going down, um, like we saw in 2011. And but at the same time, stocks really didn't really get flinched by it, uh, or or not were initially not as terribly concerned. Uh, we'll see what happens on a on a go forward basis with stocks, and and that's a whole other story. But purely on the on the debt story, uh, this this is going to be with us for some time. So even though now it's a front and center topic, you just can't fix it easily. We're we're, we're gonna you know, we're we're spending like we're in a recession, but we're not. I guess, but we don't know yet. But we think we're not. Uh, we're spending as if we're in like a, a major war, but we're not really. And so, you know, th this kind of nine percent running deficit to GDP is not sustainable in a kind of peacetime slash, uh, you know, not recession period. Like, what happens if we actually go into a recession or get dragged in, you know, into a, a larger conflict? I mean, there's going to be a lot more spending, right? So. Like we were, we're you're supposed to, um, you know, use your fiscal stabilizers when you're in a crisis or when things are uh, the economy is weak, and you're supposed to then pay down your debt when the economy is strong. We're we're doing the opposite right now. Yeah, which is absolutely crazy, especially considering like sort of the starting point. Um, you know, so that that was that was you know so so very very good comparison. You know, certainly makes a lot of sense. You know, but let's kind of I'm I'm just. I really would like to drill down into why, why now, you know, like the, the U S has been on an unsustainable, you know, path of ever increasing debt for what feels like, I don't know, forever. Um, so really what, what is, you know, let's be, let's, let's drill down a little bit more. Let's be a little bit more specific. Why, why now what's different now? Well, I think one of the big, big pieces of the puzzle brings us back to the fed in, in a couple different ways. So some people have downplayed QT. You know, I have not. I think QT matters. Quantitative tightening, that is, which is the you know the process of the Fed allowing its balance sheet to allow bonds to mature or prepay and roll off their balance sheet. Um, you know, the, that monetary policy, you know, people will say, well, that's just very much on the front end and it really doesn't really matter. That's only true if you're running either a surplus or a very little deficit. But when you have a large deficit like we have now, and you're compounding it by then having the bonds that were once owned by the Fed, now someone else has to go buy those because the Treasury still has to replace that financing. It's not as if we're paying down debt. We're expanding debt, right? So those bonds roll off the Fed's balance sheet. They have to get paid. They get issued by different parts across the whole Treasury curve because that's how the Treasury finances itself. It just doesn't pick one spot. And so that increases the overall you know, just kind of debt burden on the treasury, right? So the QT matters. And I think now it's really starting to bite. Um, so then that's from the Fed angle. The other Fed angle is they've raised rates over 500 basis points, which is now all of this QT bonds that are being replaced, as well as all this new debt is being struck at a super high coupon, which we have not had for, for decades. And that's, and that's adding to the interest burden of the nation, you know, and that's competing with, other parts on the you know on the line items of the budget 
And again, also in a in a in a in a way compounding the deficit because the interest cost gets larger each time with even more debt, and then at higher rates, then it's just you're paying debt to kind of pay interest and vice versa. So um, it, it, this is why I think it matters more than the 2011 experience because a we had half the debt now we have more than double the debt at a in a rising rate environment with QT two being double the speed of QT one. And we did, we, we, were, we were at least um, in 2011 through 2018, our deficits were going, were shrinking. They were going lower and lower each time because we had this, you know, fiscal uh, impasse, but it led to a kind of austerity period and sequestration, which allowed for the debt to come, come, uh, come down and grow along with the economy. Like we were doing the opposite, like I said before. So it's just the, the massive deficits, the debt load being more than double, uh, interest costs being super high and having this kind of negative feedback loop and what the Fed is doing and the Fed, you know, for now is sticking to its message that it's, you know, maybe not done yet or at least higher for longer. It, it really means that rates are going to um, be felt more so through the public sector, which has become an even bigger part of the U.S. economy. So it, it means that we're going to have to start making tougher decisions about like where we're, we're spending our money. And uh, and it also means that the governor on economic growth is actually going to come through the treasury market versus just the banking sector or the Fed, you know, impacting financial markets. This is really new, and this is something that we haven't really dealt with. It's like uh, it's the old textbook uh, definition of crowding out, where the government, you know, debt, you know, starts to kind of compete with private credit. And the availability of credit throughout the broader economy. So, you know, the Fed being super tight, banks also tightening. And then if this fiscal impulse that we had is not sustainable, which I think it really isn't, so deficits should come down, that becomes another kind of constraint as well on economic activity. Yeah, I mean that that is not a pretty picture you are painting. Um, so yeah, so it sounds like you know this is this is the same story that we've that we've been you know talking about and been observing. Um, it just is more acute for all the reasons that you mentioned. Um, so you know that I think that was a pretty comprehensive discussion of uh, you know of the of of the downgrade and implications and 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 this this you know this just huge stock of debt that we have. Um, why don't we move on? move on from that i'd like to conclude you know kind of talking about you know markets near term you know i know you're heading out on vacation for the tail end of august but before you go what's on your radar in the near term um what should investors be looking for as we head into the labor day holiday as we head out of it into kind of when business tends to restart at the beginning of september um you know certainly jackson hole you know is top of mind you know t- tell us about that tell us about what else we should be watching for yeah, so I mean, look, I guess I can like start from Labor Day uh, to now. We have uh, in the next couple of weeks, we have, of course, NFP on the first before actually um, we go into Labor Day. Um, so we'll get a, a a read on the health of the labor market before Labor Day, ironically enough. And um, and so far we've had like you know two weaker NFP prints under two hundred thousand. Again. It's still positive growth. And so like the, the counter, you know, the rebuttal is usually, well, we're still growing, creating jobs and unemployment rate is super low still. But that's typically what happens at the end of cycles, not at the beginning of new cycles. This idea that we're going to no land, I mean, at best soft land, if but even soft land is really more of a mid-cycle slowdown because we have been growing since we reopened the economy. And so this idea that we're going to soft land and it's, it's more in reality, a mid-cycle adjustment to the economy can we in fact handle higher rates? So, you know, I don't believe in the no landing and I have a very low probability of that and, and soft landing uh, similar. But in the in the meantime, you don't know because you're kind of going through this process of figuring out how lagged is jobs data. We've had six uh, revisions in a row since the beginning of the year, typically really only happens before recessions. And so again, we don't know, this, is, this has been a very, a unusual kind of recovery and the in the in the cadence of various parts of the of the system haven't all lined up in the same at the same time. So maybe we kind of just stumble through this and we, we avoid a recession, but still kind of not a great outlook. But the jobs market is going to be super critical to that because like you know the Fed wants to see some slack reintroduced um and get out of this tight labor market that we're in. 
and see wages kind of come off a little bit, see inflation really on the core side come off, and, and that's really all services. So I think like NFP matters now. I mean, it, it always does, but I think if we, you know, we get um, another kind of weak reading, sub 200,000, I think that should basically mean that the Fed's not hiking in September. Uh, and like, and of course we get inflation before the Fed meets again, but as long as like, you know, we don't get like a three or 400,000 job growth and like a really super low unemployment rate and high wages, if we don't get that, then I think, you know, the, the hurdle's pretty high for them to hike in September, even if inflation picks up, which it probably will a little bit, but not enough to get them to go in September. So I think NFP is critical. And then working our way backwards, we do have Jackson Hole, like you mentioned, um, and even the topic for Jackson Hole now seems a little bit more focused on growth and kind of the disruptions to growth. Uh, so I feel like they're starting to kind of pivot away from just um, obsessing about inflation and focusing on you know their, their dual mandate. And I think that's going to be interesting. Um, and we'll see what comes out of that. There's always, you know, if, if you remember last year, Jackson Hole is when like Super Hog Powell came out and that's when he really got the markets to really pay attention that they meant business, that they were going to take rates really high. So I don't think there's a repeat of that. So let's let's see what we get from Jackson Hole. Uh, I think there's some revisions from BLS. I think also that are due to come out at some point during the week as well. So that's something I'll be I'd be looking out as for as well. Um, and then just in general, because it's the end of the month and end of August, and it's the less liquid time of the year. Uh, that plus you know the holidays at the end of the year. I think you know we just have to be on guard for just liquidity gaps. And just really watching the FX market and then how the curve is trading. I mean, the curve can get air pockets very quickly. We've seen moments of it already where you can just get like these big steepening type moves. Um, and I think like I've written in you know in my August kind of PowerPoint this anti seasonals which we discussed before. Like everything's ap- everything's op- like operating on the like uh, as an opposite of what you would expect. So like you almost have to rewire yourself a little bit for August. And uh, so, yeah, so watch the FX markets. The dollar is at critical levels here. Uh, the dollar, people call it the wrecking ball for a reason. If it gets stronger, um, you know, that really, you know, it will be an issue for emerging markets. Um, and given like what the sort of news that we're getting out of China, like that, that's super critical to watch what the dollar is doing. So that's really, you know, in a nutshell, dollar sort of curve behavior. And like, let's see what the NFP brings us in Jackson Hole. All right. Well, sounds like a busy end to what's been so far a a busy summer. Um, uh, And and for our listeners, I would encourage you to check out uh, George's recently published U.S. Fiscal Perspectives piece. Discusses a lot of the same things that George has been kind enough to share with us uh, today on the episode. And if you are not receiving George's strategy reports, please do get in contact with him directly. George, great stuff as always. Thanks again for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, and, the, and this will be a, a much larger piece, and you'll see a lot of interesting charts and, and more details in what we described today. All right, good stuff. And thank you for listening to the MUFG Global Markets Podcast. Rate, review, and subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And reach out to your MUFG sales rep for any further information. Check back soon for more insights from the Global Markets Research Team.